The issue of homelessness can seem so big and so daunting where all potential solutions, particularly during a pandemic, are futile. But tonight, we're not going to think about the massive problem of homelessness. Instead, we're going to talk about one homeless person. Her name was Margaret. Life and Death on the Streets is Denise Davies' contribution to understanding this issue better. And Denise joins us now from Burlington to talk about Margaret. Denise, it's great to see you again. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Not too bad. Thank you very much. Let's go back. I want you to take us back to the 1940s. When Margaret was born, she grew up in Barbados. What was her childhood like? So her parents were Pentecostal missionaries. Uh, who had gone to Barbados, both Canadians. Uh, they'd been assigned to uh, Barbados to build new churches, get new members. Um, and they arrived there in uh, 1943, and uh, Margaret was born less than a year later. Uh, right from birth, uh, she proved to be a disappointment to her father, who very much wanted a boy. Um, and for the rest of her childhood, it was really a, a very rigid schedule of, of church Bible schools. She ran the Sunday school class. Uh, she learned how to play piano and accordion so she could play in church. Um, it, church was a, a seven day a week uh, event. And, and did, Margaret, often had, did Margaret like having the church being that large a factor in her life? Um, I think Margaret was very much the dutiful daughter. She really looked up to her dad and, and all indications uh, show that she really tried hard to win his approval and to be the daughter that he wanted her to be. And he was very strict and authoritarian. Um, the kids were, you know, spanked if they didn't behave. And um, the, the youngest brother really talked about growing up in a loveless home. It really wasn't um, warm and fuzzy. She hmm. she really tried hard to be accepted. But I, I think it was quite, quite a grueling, uh, strict household. And at what point did people start to notice that there was something perhaps a miss about Margaret's behavior. So as in many cases with mental illness, especially schizophrenia, it, the symptoms started to surface when she was about 15. She ran into the house one day and told her mother that she could hear her boyfriend calling her from an airplane above. Um, she told uh, her mother that the uh, her teacher, her male teacher was starting to have feelings for her um, and that escalated. Um, so you've got this sort of behavior uh, to the point where she was actually like breaking windows and running around the house naked in front of her brothers. So you've got a, a, any, any household that would be disruptive, but a household that considers themselves role models for the community. Um, it was highly unacceptable. So she was taken to the doctor and on a small island back in uh, the 19, early 1960s, medicine and resources would have been very uh, bear. Um, and so that's probably why she was given uh, electroshock treatments at the age of 15. Um, apparently they worked, and uh, but then their symptoms came back and she was, um, uh, she had another round. Well, let, let's talk about that because I'm going to take it to 1962 now. I guess she's about 17 or 18 years old and she tries to take her life. She, sl she slits mm -hmm. her wrists. Where, d where did that happen? Why did it happen? So they, uh, the family uh, all of a sudden up and moved, and it was probably because of Margaret's uh, problems. Uh, they up and moved to Galt, which is now uh, Cambridge, uh, probably because uh, her mother had a sister living there. And um, they hoped, I think, with family support, new surroundings, that Margaret would get better, and instead she got worse. Uh, one night they heard, um, this is all documented in her files, they heard a peculiar scratching sound behind the door of the bathroom and opened it and she had slashed both of her wrists. Now, in typical Margaret style, and this ha happened right up until her, she died really, um, she, was, she was very flippant about it. She said that uh, a, a friend had told her about it and that she just wanted to see if it hurt. Um, so then after that, she was actually admitted to the Homewood um, and after two ad admissions there, she was, um, th they, they told the family, listen, just like in Barbados, we don't have the resources here for Margaret and she needs a long-term um, chronic hospital like the Ontario Hospital in Hamilton. Well, that takes us to the next part of the story because I, I actually grew up about five minutes from what we used to call the OH back in the day, the Ontario right. Hospital, the psychiatric hospital on the West Mountain of Hamilton. Um, okay, so she's admitted there and what happens to her while she's there? 
So, so she would have been 18, um, and you could just imagine um, 18 years old, and suddenly you're in a hospital ward. Um, with the, so many unfortunate things happened to this poor young girl. Um, her family, within about a year, uh, the father had already moved to the States to take um, uh, French lessons. He wanted to be a French teacher. And so the mother, uh, Verna, decided to move there with the three brothers basically completely abandoning her behind, leaving her behind in Canada. Uh, after that, they rarely saw her. She wrote and got letters. Uh, she, she was left alone to navigate the system. Um, so the other thing that happened is that deinstitutionalization was already into in full swing. And that meant they were trying to discharge uh, psychiatric patients from hospitals in order to close beds. Uh, Margaret was um, one of many victims of that plan. Um, which was a, a positive thing in the sense that, yes, move people into the community, let them live more productive lives, but have the supports and the support of housing there, and that wasn't there. So they, they discharged her into the community within two years of being admitted to the hospital, so at the age of 20, and the first time she was found in a room by herself ripping up newspapers. The whole room was, was filled with these ripped up newspapers, and they guessed that she'd been there about a week, she hadn't eaten, uh, she went back to the hospital. They patched her up. Uh, within a couple of months, they tried moving her out again. Now, we have to appreciate what was capable, what, what the system was capable of at the time. But given everything you know about this, what would you rate as the as the level of care that she got when she was at the OH in Hamilton? So, in, inside the hospital, um, I mean, it likely was not the best uh, situation. Um, my understanding is they did have like uh, a typing class, which she did try to participate in. Um, she did some pottery for a while. She helped out with laundry. Uh, there were things like that, but there were a lot of things she didn't want to participate in too. Um, I found, I lucked out and found two social workers who actually were at the hospital when Margaret was there. And the one uh, social worker set up um, classes to teach uh, the patients how to take the bus and how to read a grocery flyer, how to grocery shop, all sort of help trying to help them move into the community. And um, she said Margaret was a really angry woman and she wouldn't participate. She often liked to just lean against a wall and just smoke all day, just two packs of cigarettes. So it, it wasn't a really positive environment, but certainly the environment they put her into in the community was much worse. Let me pick up on your comments of a few moments ago when you talked about deinstitutionalization, because in the 1960s, this became, I guess, quote unquote, the way to go uh, for, for so much of society. Essentially, the plan was, as you point out, to get people out of institutions, to get them into the community, and to try to kind of integrate them into the community as best as possible. What went wrong? So the, there was two parts to the plan. Um, close the beds, and by the time it was over, within a couple of decades, they closed 80% of psychiatric hospital beds across Canada, close the beds, and then build the mental health clinics near to where the patients were being moved. Hire social workers and uh, caseworkers to visit people in the community. Um, put the supports there to help them get uh, jobs and, and to rebuild a life in the community. Um, Margaret needed a lot of intensive care, and in, in, which getting the 24-7 care in the hospital, even that, like I said, she floundered and didn't like to participate in some things. Uh, to put her into an unsupervised, unregulated boarding home where the operator knew nothing about mental illness or psychiatric patients was absolutely appalling. And, and the outcome was predictable. So time after time, she was discharged over those years, nine, ten times. She came back in worse shape every single time. Every single time, she was more and more sick. And yet, doctors would <laughs> patch her up, as the social worker told me. And uh, within sometimes weeks, uh, she'd be back into another boarding home. Now, when she was discharged from the Ontario hospital, uh, where would she go? Is she living back at home? Is she living on the streets? What's her situation? No, every time she was discharged, it was into another boarding home. 
they were on Emerald Street, King Street, Main Street, uh, uh, Lemming Street. They, they had the addresses in her medical files. Uh, so every single time she'd be in one of these rundown boarding homes, which, um, by the way, even after the 80s, when they brought in regulations and, and inspections of these homes, there was still problems. And, and today in Hamilton, these homes are still being closed down because of lack of safety and hygiene problems. So back in the 60s and 70s, they were much, much worse. So it was a gradual wearing down of, of her. She would go into the home, and the first thing that would happen is they give her a bus ticket to come up to the hospital and get her medication once or twice a week, and she would stop going. And she stopped going because she had a serious mental illness. It's not one that she said, I'm, I'm going to rebel or, or what I mean, she wasn't able to function on her own. She needed a lot of supports. And so you get an operator, like I said, who's in it, in it just for the money and it's just a business situation for him. Um, and then so with each time, she would start spending more and more time on the street. And finally, up until like the early 80s, uh, she was spending a lot of time on the streets. Um, in in 72, she got pregnant, and, um, you know, that was a whole other uh, catastrophe on its own. Do you want to go down that road right now? Because that, that is a fascinating part of this book where she does get pregnant, and, and she keeps the child. Well, well she, she, she has she, the baby. She wants to keep the child. She's in the hospital with, uh, she, she named him uh, Jeffrey. She's in the hospital with Jeffrey for eight days, and... Um, and then she's pretty much, to, she agrees finally, her, her mother actually does come up from the States to, to convince her that she needs to give up the baby. Uh, so she does agree to do that and, and signs the paperwork. Um, but uh, it, it, all indications in her medical files show that after those eight days, she's basically discharged onto the streets again. And so a th about a couple of months later, they find her in this uh, house that the, the, the neighbors actually call because they said there was just like five, five drunks was the way that it was described that she was living with. And she was bought by an ambulance back to the hospital again. And again, she's sickly. Um, she's catatonic. She's covered in bruises and cuts. Um, it, it clearly every sign that, that, that she wasn't capable of living in the community on her own. Hmm. Okay, let's let's go up to, um, as we might say, drone in the sky level here and take a look at how Margaret is a piece of a much bigger puzzle. For example, th th I mean, there are plenty of, sadly, plenty of homeless people in this province and country right now. What percentage of them, do we have a good estimate as to what percentage are dealing with mental health issues? Mm -hmm. So, very good question. Um, first off, just the whole statistics around homelessness are so hard to pin down. They have a thing called point in time where uh, the cities venture out and try to get sort of a, a count. Right now, they say in Canada, on any given night, about 35,000 people are homeless. I have to think the number is much higher than that. I'm just having been to shelters and, uh, I mean, in Toronto alone, there's 7,000 people sleeping in shelters every night just in Toronto. So I, I happen to believe that it's a lot higher. And in terms of mental illness, um, I know the Canadian Mental Health Association said that it might be as high as 70%. Um, and again, I, having been to these shelters as when I first met Margaret, um, I, I, I have to say it was even 80% because the, the other thing that happens is that within even a couple of weeks on the street, your physical and mental health start to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. So rates of, of anxiety and depression uh, are sky high among homeless people. You, so you, there's a very high. You, you kind of buried the lead a little bit in the middle of that answer, Denise, in as much as you did meet Margaret. Tell us the circumstances yes. under which you first met her. So it was uh, 1993. I've been sitting in my newsroom for months writing stories about, on sort of studies and statistics on homelessness. And I said to my editor, um, I really think I need to put a face to this issue. I like to spend the night at the Wesley Center, which was known for sort of the really chronically homeless would go there. It was um, a really, uh, you get the really run down, um, very ill people. Uh, so I showed up about 11 p.m. on a very cold winter night, January, and within about an hour, uh, Margaret wandered in, and um, that was 27 years ago, and I still remember that moment because I was absolutely shocked. Um, I looked at her across the room and thought, how is this woman even walking? She was so worn down. Um, she looked like she was at death's door. 
I mean, I say my book, she, she reminded me of like what you think of an inmate in a Victorian workhouse or something. So I, I asked staff about her. They said her nickname was Princess Margaret. Um, and uh, the interesting thing was that she said to me, don't, don't talk to her because uh, we don't think you should approach her. But she has a habit of uh, smashing people across the face with these hard melamine coffee cups they use there. And I, I, knowing what I did about homelessness, that, that she'd probably be victimized, a uh, victim of violence many times. And I figured that was a defense mechanism. And I thought if, if I don't hurt her, she's not going to hurt me. So I did wander over, and um, the amazing thing was nobody at the shelter really knew her story, even though she'd been coming for eight, nine, ten years. And she opened up to me. She told me her whole life story. We sat and talked for 45 minutes, and um, my heart just broke looking at her, and I just thought, I have to tell her story. So you're a Hamilton Spectator reporter at the time, and you go over and you befriend her and start talking to her, and this began... What? What was the nature of your relationship going forward? I mean, over that she died two years later, uh, and over those two years, I saw her periodically on the street. And then there was one time at Good Shepherd Center, uh, ladies drop in where I met up with her again. She remembered my name. She remembered that I was a reporter. Um, I mean, she was a smart woman. So. I mean, looking back, I wish I did have more of a relationship with her. I wish I'd taken her for lunch or helped her in some way. Um, that didn't happen, but uh, I, I, and I'm not sure I, I could have helped at that point because she was just so worn down. The scene where you describe in the book how she died is really quite, it's quite heartbreaking. Denise, do you want to go through some of it? What happened on that day? So it, December 6th, uh, night of uh, cities across Canada were uh, honoring the Montreal massacre anniversary. Uh, she left the Wesley Center about 4 p.m. with her friend Bob. And um, they, it would not reopen until midnight. So she knew she had eight hours to kill. It was really snowy, cold night. She made her way uh, east on King Street. I actually retraced her steps one night. And um, made her way two hours later. So something must have happened along the way because it was only about a 15-minute walk. Uh, she made her way to the sub shop. Uh, she settled into a chair with a cup of tea. And she had this habit of um, she would cup the tea with her hands and let the steam come over her face to keep warm. And the staff person saw her and thought, you know what, I'm glad she's out of the cold. I'll let her, I'll let her rest. And uh, customers started to complain. So she phoned the 911, and um, I don't. She doesn't know why she did this, but she said to the 911 people, uh, "There's a bum in our shop. Uh, we don't keep that clientele here. That type of clientele. Can you please remove her?" So she thinks that's why it took so long for the police to get there because it, it was five 911 calls later, and about an hour and a half they arrived, and by that time she had actually fallen out of her chair, and a pool of blood was around her head. Uh, they took her to the Hamilton General, uh, which is only a five-minute drive, and uh, she died within about an hour of uh, heart failure. She had, she had a heart attack. That's what killed her? Mm, that's Well, that's what technically on the coroner's report, but really it was, uh, you know, many, many years of neglect and, and homelessness is what killed her. Is there any doubt in your mind that had she not been who she was and when that 911 call was originally made, it would not, not have taken five calls to get some action? Absolutely. I mean, when when she did fall, the staffer called again and said, "Listen, now it's you know it's a serious medical situation. Apparently, it was upgraded to a life and death call at that point, but it still took them that long. So um, again, I mean, her body was so run down, it was so much older. I say in the book, like one year in the streets is like a lifetime somewhere else. Uh, it was so worn down. She, she'd she already surpassed the average age the per homeless person dies in Canada is 39. And she was how old? She was 51 when she died. 51. But she would have been alive. She could have been alive today because she would only be 76. So. Mm. Um, I do have to ask you, Denise, because you do touch on this in the book, that son that she gave up, Jeff, mm -hmm. you met him, yes? Mm -hmm. I did. That was this, I say it was the story that kept following me. Um, is uh, So at the time, I thought there was no paper trail. I didn't I had any idea how I could track, down, track him down. Um, but three years after I wrote the story, I got a phone call from a woman who claimed to be uh, engaged to Margaret's son. 
Um, and I thought that's this is probably not true. There wasn't enough information really in my story to for this person to know that. But um, anyways, she convinced me to let them meet let me meet them because she said you're his only contact with his birth mother. So I, I couldn't say no. Uh, they came to my house, and as soon as he walked in, I saw Margaret's face. It was, a, like I say, a male version, a much softer version, uh, but the same chin, high forehead, nose. And um, that was quite the meeting. And I've, I've kept in touch with him. Now, that kid's in his 40s now. What's happened to his life? Mm -hmm. So, uh, coincidentally, just back to the adoption, um, the, the couple, the Hamilton couple who ad adopted him already had a son named Jeffrey that they adopted, which is ironic, a coincidence. So, and so they renamed him Jeremy. And um, I say, I do say in the book, like uh, a couple years after I, I met him, he started showing signs of uh, mental illness. So he he's had his own struggles as well, unfortunately. The Not as bad as Margaret. But the cycle continues. Exactly. I'm just gonna ask our director, Sheldon Osmond. Sheldon, go to the top of page four, if you would. Let's bring up this quote. This is from your book. This is, you're quoting Charles Krauthammer, the, uh, uh, I, I think he was a psychiatrist as well as a, a great author. And uh, he wrote, 30 years ago, if you saw a person lying helpless on the street, you ran to help him. Now you step over him. You know that he is not an accident victim. He lives there. How did this cultural shift happen in which we now view homelessness so differently from the way apparently we did half a century ago? I, it's a very good question. I, I think it was so gradual. Um, and, and along the way, there was this uh, very convenient for the politicians um, attitudinal shift where we just started to blame the homeless person. I mean, my opinion of that is that the homeless have no voice. Um, you know, the politicians are going to answer because it's, it's only lack of political will that the homeless problem hasn't been solved. A medicine had Alberta has almost eliminated homelessness. They have the entire country of Finland, uh, Utah. There's there's cities all over the Canada and the world that have solved homelessness. We know how to do it. It's it's not an impossible problem, and it's it's supportive housing, and community supports. Um, so it hasn't happened because, like I said, the homeless don't vote. They don't have a voice. And oftentimes, like Margaret, um, they've lost touch with their family, so their family's not about to advocate for them. Um, but I, as I say in my book, there has been a lot of studies showing that to keep a person homeless on the streets for a year can cost about $100,000. And to house them and, and offer supports would be about $24,000. So mm. if, if they're not worried about the human cost, then they should be worried about the economic costs. Um, and, and then there's a lot of myths. I can't tell you how many people I've told the story, uh, I've told Margaret's story to, and then they said, you know, a lot of people want it. That's a choice for them. They want to live on the street. And I said, no, it's not. That's a, not a choice that anyone makes. You don't grow up saying, I'm going to be homeless when I grow up. It, it's, it's when you've run out of all other options and that's there's nothing left. Hmm. Um, so there's that misconception. And I don't think the general public knows how really sick homeless people are that there's huge rates of like i said mental illness but also diabetes epilepsy uh level four cancers uh dr stephen wang in toronto has done a huge amount of work on that um and he said that um i think that their uh the amount of times that they show up in the er is about eight times uh, the amount that the general population um hmm. so that's where part of, that's where a huge chunk of the hundred thousand dollars is coming from is because and then they, they leave with uh, antibiotics or some sort of medication or maybe, uh, you know, wrapping t for their uh, a cat or something, and they have no place to recover. So they don't take their medication. They get more sick. They end up in the ER in another week or so. So the attitudinal shift um, is because people don't know the cost. They don't know how ill people are. And also, like I said, um, there's this tendency to, to blame them, like they're lazy. Um, and I have to say, in Margaret's medical files, um, and, and this is just one of the 869 pages of her file that I have, um, <laughs> there were constant notes from doctors and nurses saying that Margaret's misbehaving again, and she's come back to the hospital 
mismanaging her funds and and trying to manipulate her way into the hospital. And I'm reading this going that she was schizophrenic. And this isn't about uh, mismanaging her funds. She was simply not capable of doing it. And so that attitude still exists, like blame the victim. In our last couple of minutes here, Denise, I want to focus in on Margaret and the end of her life again. She did have a funeral. Who paid for that mm -hmm. funeral? So I, I wouldn't call it a, a funeral by our standards, but um, so, and one thing that happened is the police didn't bother to tell anybody in the community, even though, like I said, she was so well known, they affectionately called her Princess Margaret. She was very well known. They didn't tell anybody. Uh, they hired a funeral company uh, that did city funded uh, burials. And um, she made the lonely drive um, to the uh, Woodland Cemetery um, one cold winter morning about uh, six days after she died, I think. And um, there was there was nobody there. I, I, I say in my book that it I, I 30, 3,842 people died in the city of Hamilton the year Margaret died. And she was probably one of the few that had nobody waiting for her when she got there. No words were said. It was like she'd never been born. I wanna, so she died a very lonely death. Yeah, I want to ask you a very, um, I don't mean it to be a disrespectful question, but it's a hard question, and that is, she had a funeral, nobody showed up. Did her life matter? Oh, well, I did. I, when word got out a couple of days later, uh, there were 25 of us standing around her gravesite saying goodbye to Margaret. And I mean, I was I was there that December 6, um, you know, two months ago, uh, saying goodbye to Margaret. Her life mattered uh, in huge ways. And um, I mean, there were all, all kinds of calls for inquests. There were vigils. There were protests after she died. Um, people were really, really angry. Um, Lynn Ferris at the Wesley said, like, I, I can't even go to any more funerals. There's just, they just, people just keep dying. And um, so, I mean, I'm hoping through her book that her life matters even more because putting a, a face to homelessness and, and certainly being able to write her whole life story uh, like this, I hope that people... We'll see people on the streets and say, that person has a name, there's someone's son or daughter, and their life matters. They're, this is a, a, it's a brutal betrayal, really, of one of the most vulnerable groups of people in our society, and something needs to be done. Her name was Margaret, Life and Death on the Streets, and it's brought Denise Davey to our studio, virtually from Burlington. Denise, great job. It's a superb book, and I wish you well. Thank you so much, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.